Hello, colleagues around the world. I'm happy to have a chance to share my own thought on interventional research with you. Since my field of research interest is a little bit different from most of yours, for this lecture, I decide to spend my time in giving you a glimpse of idea what is going on in this neurovascular world together with a, a brief introduction of our, our team's projects. My talk would be a mixture of the past history, current status, our team need research experience, and the future perspectives. When we need to talk about the history of a neural intervention, or should start with an eminent neurosurgeon from Russia, Dr. Serebinenko, he is showing drawings describing a brain ABM case before treatment and after treatment, done by the device developed by himself, which is the detachable balloon system. He devised a handmade latex balloon attached to a very low-profile caster like this. It turned out that the balloon embolization was very effective for control of high-flow fistulous lesion. That was early 70s. The system was further developed in the Western world. This is an example of a successful embolization of the basilla tip aneurysm with the detachable balloon system. However, as you may expect, the balloon embolization was technically quite demanding and uh, showed a lot of limitation in the complex situation. Even though there had been further technical development like this, however, its indication had stayed quite limited. Although we could enjoy the dramatic role of the balloon system from time to time in unique lesions such as the CCF up to late 80s, usual possible coils and the glue were the main embolization tools for us. For these technical limitations, neural intervention had been remained just as a small part of a neuroradiology profession. And then a new groundbreaking technology came, the Detachable Embolization Coil System, GDC. The idea of which was from an Italian neurosurgeon, Guido Guglielmi. He joined the UCLA neuroradiology team, which was led by Drs. Vinuela and uh, Doug Weiler in 1989. They developed this GDC system with the company Target Therapeutics. The technology turned out to be very effective in the endovascular treatment of both ruptured and unruptured cerebral aneurysms. It was 1955. With this, they could open a new chapter in the neuro intervention history. Since then, the coil system has developed a lot with various features, with various purposes, and also with various detachment mechanisms. As of now, from time to time, I'm feeling dizzy due to the selection difficulty out of too much choices in front of me. They call it paradox of choice. A stand which definitely is the most important device in our field, regardless of the target organs. Needless to say, we were in dire need of a dedicated neurovascular stent system, since treatment of the intracranial stenosis was also a huge clinical unmet need. And the delivery of a stent to the intracranial arteries is very challenging due to the relatively small arterial diameter and the tortuosity of the parent artery. See the tortuosity of this cavernous segment of the ICA. Development of a neural stent was challenging, not just because of the technical difficulty in the fabrication of a low-profile stent itself, 
But also because of the lack of delivery caster system, which could adapt for those tortuosity. We waited for several years for the introduction of a neurostent system for the revascularization therapy. However, the leading company at that time released a stent for the aneurysm treatment first. You may not understand why we need a stent for the aneurysm treatment. Let me explain why. No sooner we had the early clinical report on the successful use of endovascular coiling in the treatment of the cerebral aneurysms in 1997, then a case report was published on the successful use of a coronary stent in the treatment of a fusiform basilar artery aneurysm, which had no other treatment option at that time. That was a rupture of the proximal basilar trunk aneurysm. After a second rupture, the UCSF team devised a creative endovascular solution since clipping surgery is not applicable and uh, the endovascular coiling seemed impossible due to its very widening, as you can see here. They decided to put a stent in the parent artery to prevent coil loop herniation during coil packing like this. This is the beginning of so-called stent-assisted coiling. However, as you may expect, the delivery of those stiff stents is very difficult for the intracranial arteries. This is why we need a dedicated neural stent in the aneurysm coiling. And then several years later, the neuroform stent was developed and available for us. It was early 2000. See how the stent works for this aneurysm. As of now, about 40 percent of the cerebral aneurysms are embolized with the stent-assisted coiling. These are pictures of the stents currently available in Korean market. This is the solitaire stent, which is equipped with a detachment system. The stent is retrievable as long as you are not detaching the stent. Please remember it because it will come back again in my talk later on. And this is a stent developed by a local Korean company together with our team, Alpha Stent. We reported our experience of a successful clinical application of this stent two years ago. This is one of the clinical cases. Here you can see a good wall opposition of the stent, even in the tortuous segment. Actually, you can do coil embolization without a stent like this using a compliant balloon caster or with many other dedicated new devices. Of course, you may add another new device from your own idea in this list. And then eventually a dedicated stent system was introduced for the stenosis treatment. An open cell design, self-expanding stent system worked quite nicely in a straightforward mechanism of a vascular stent like this. This is a case of a symptomatic right MCA stenosis. Balloon angioplasty was done with a little bit of improvement. And then the stent delivery system was introduced for the deployment of the self-expanding stent. The stent is barely visible. This is the DSA showing a nice luminal restoration. Unfortunately, however, the clinical trial failed to show any superiority compared with the best medical treatment in the secondary stroke prevention for the intracranial stenosis due to pretty high periprocedural morbidity in the stenting group. We are definitely in need of a safer system for this purpose as of now. Our team is also working on a new concept device to cope with this clinical need. By the way, about two-thirds of the ischemic stroke is due to thromboembolic occlusion of the intracranial arteries like this. 
although we can apply IV TPA infusion as the first line reconnalization treatment, but the efficacy is limited. In cases with a larger clot burden, we used to do local intraarterial infusion of the fibrinolytics like TPA or urokinase. That wasn't that effective in general. Sometimes it ended up with fatal hemorrhages like this. After experiencing such bad clinical outcomes repeatedly, we decided to put a self-expanding stent at the occluded artery or segment like this. This is a case of right MCA occlusion. The microcaster was navigated across the clot like this. A stent was deployed and the patient was on antithrombotic medication after that, expecting endogenous clot lysis. With this, we could maintain the patency as you can see on the follow-up CT angiography the next day. We reported our experience of a successful application of the self-expanding stents for the acute stroke intervention in 2012. After reporting this, we thought that what if we can retrieve the stent later on as you are doing with the vena cava filters. We proposed the concept of temporary stenting. So we decided to develop a temporary stenting device, the concept of which was already patented in 2008 by our team. This is the concept of that approach. This is the MCA occluded by a clot and recognized by the stenting and show the spontaneous lysis with the flow and the antithrombotic medication. After that, we can retrieve the device one or two days later. SNG company R&D team manufactured a nice device for the initial preclinical study. We conducted an animal study in the carotid artery model. And we are nearly about to prove our idea and prepared for the national R&D grant application. However, we had to stop our project due to a report from Europe. In 2009, a Swiss neurointervention team observed an interesting finding during coil embolization of a wide neck aneurysm. They used the solitaire stent, a detachable stent, which I told you before, for the stent-assisted coiling. However, they experienced platelet aggregation and eventual parent artery occlusion. To solve the problem, they decided to retrieve the stent and found aggregated clots around the mesh of the solitaire stent and the complete reconnalization of the occluded artery. This was the moment when the idea of mechanical clot retrieval popped up. This is one of the initial clinical reports on the successful application of the solitaire stent in the thrombectomy since then. We coined a new term, stent river, meaning a stent-like clot retriever. Please check out following dedicated stent reverse. Our team is also working on it. Actually, we don't expect a better stent river than other ones in the market as of now. However, we believe we need to develop this device further because this stent system could be a good platform of new technology. One example is the stent road, stent-based electrode. A group from Royal Melbourne Hospital reported a successful initial clinical application last year. It was a totally new implantation method for a motor neuroprosthesis for quadriplegic patients. They used a stent rod as the receiver electrode in reading the signals from the motor cortex. They could create a brain-computer interface through percutaneous transvenous insertion without any craniotomy. We found a new role for us. 
no need to worry about losing our job. Not to mention, this stent road idea can be applied in non-neural situations too. Don't forget that the electrode was inserted via venous root. Actually, we do use a server venous root for the transvenous treatment of various lesions such as dural arteriovenous fistula and the brain AVM. However, we seldom think of this venous structure as the source of neuro disease or main target of our endovascular treatment, except dural sinus thrombosis treatment like this. Here comes another serendipity episode, this time with us. One day, an idea hit me. You may remember Monroe-Kelly doctrine from the medical school. If the intracranial pressure, ICP, measured at any location in the intracranial cavity is the same, then why not in the dural sinuses? The pressure in the dural sinus would reflect the ICP. Then we can measure the ICP obviating these invasive current methods. These pictures are our basic idea of both transarterial and transvenous pressure sensing methods. Our colleagues in the Georgia Tech are working on developing a telemetric method in the pressure measurement. I think this would be a good initiation of venous intervention in neurovascular field. For the sake of time, I intentionally skipped two more recent advancements in the aneurysm treatment. One is so-called flow diversion technique, and the other is flow disruption technique for the treatment of cerebral aneurysms. Actually, we are also working on these two. One more thing I didn't cover today is the new polymer embolic material, such as onyx or fill. This is a whole new, another one hour topic. Other than these, I believe we do need functional devices, for example, drug eluting devices for the facilitation of current treatment efficacy and for the development of totally new indication of interventional treatment approach. I wish this talk could help you having a rough idea what is going on in the neurointerventional R&D arena. You may think most of the ideas and the devices are just variations from other interventional fields. Anyway, as you have seen in my talk, there are situations that a certain innovative technology is leading our clinical practice. If we are not proactive in the innovation, then we have no choice but to be just an adopter for the technology in our practice. Please stay innovative in your practice. Thank you for your attention.